ever free, okay? So I'd like for us to look at John chapter 2 for a while this morning. Okay, can I ask all of us to stand on our feet for a while? I hope you folks brought your Bibles with you. Okay, test, okay? All right, people at the back, can you hear me well? The audio is good, all right. Okay, uh, that's John chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. We gave out, if you remember, we gave out uh, a Bible reading calendar, okay, uh, last Sunday or two Sundays ago, perhaps. So I hope uh, that's uh, beneficial to you. If you're using something else, it's fine, right? So as long as you are in God's Word. So we will be reading from uh, verses 1 down to verse 12, okay? John chapter 2, verses 1 down to ver- verse 1 down to verse 12, okay? It says here, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons of water. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Okay, uh, sorry. Okay, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, okay, uh, sorry, tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did a cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they they stayed there for a few days. Let's pray for a while. Lord, we know uh, that all of these things point to you. And it is our desire and it is the cry of our heart this afternoon, this morning, Lord, that we will fully see and embrace, uh, Lord, what we're being presented here today. That yes, true enough, Lord, this is talking about or perhaps our popular understanding, the popular uh, way of, 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 of understanding this is looking into how the water turned into wine. But Lord, allow us, Lord, to see things, Lord, uh, from a perspective, God, Lord, that this actually, indeed, Lord, as we read here, uh, Lord, manifest your glory, God, that leads us, Lord, to John chapter 20, Lord, that this, the reason for these things is that we may believe. We lift this up, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated now. Test. Hold on. Test, Mike. All right. Anyone here uh, who's been to a wedding, at least at least a Christian wedding at one point in your life? Anyone? All right, great. So, um, sino ba yung uh, newlyweds dito? Uh, oh, of course, Irige and Charmaine. <laughs> All right, so, so how has it been? How was the past couple of months? Okay, Jairo, Marjo, perhaps a lot of you. Okay din pala, maliit yung church, ano? So... Um, you know, in a wedding, uh, in any wedding, um, in the years that I've been in the ministry, I've officiated, I think, close to 30, um, or at least 25, okay, uh, weddings. Uh, the first one, I remember being Clifford and Mitos back in 2013. Uh, and, you know, in any, in any given wedding, um, if I ask this question, who shines the most, okay, in any given wedding? It's always the bride and the groom, isn't it? Wala pa po ako nakitang wedding na I haven't been to a wedding wherein, you know, mas, uh, you know, the, the, the bridesmaid, okay, look more spectacular than the bride, right? So, it's never always the case, okay? It's always, the, 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 the case is always that you have the, the bride and the groom 
who radiates okay in, in beauty okay uh, in, in in this sense okay um i'm looking at this and the reason why i'm talking about wedding is because the setting of the first miracle of the lord jesus christ okay happened in a wedding isn't it right so the the scenario here is a wedding so i'd like first to simply um look into your bibles for a while john chapter 2 verse 1 to 12 and li- i'd like for you to 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 see some observations that we have here okay so first okay what are some what are some factual things that we have here first um there was a wedding isn't it right that's a fact Okay, there was a wedding, okay, and then um, there is a predicament in that wedding, and that is found in verse 3. Okay, what's the predicament in the wedding? There was a shortage of wine, all right? And mind you, um, the wine that we have now, culturally speaking, the wine that we have now would be considered a hard drink during their time. All right, so you could just imagine how diluted their wine uh, is, okay, or uh, was during that time. All right, so anyway, that's just um, uh, an information perhaps. Okay, so um, there was a shortage of wine. Um, now, I don't know with you, but um, if you are, if you have your wedding and you've invited a couple of guests, uh, perhaps you've invited, um, you know, the, the, the next wedding that I'm going to officiate is Franz and Herlines. Okay, this coming March, and I don't know who's going to be next. Um, We're all praying. It's going to be Engineer Lloyd. So, yeah, so we're waiting. We're waiting if you're here. Okay, so Engineer Lloyd is waiting for you as well. Okay, so. (laughs) So, I think it's going to be scandalous if you run out of, let me just try to make this uh, or give a contemporary uh, example to this. If you have 350 guests and you run out of lechon in Filipino culture, that's, you know, that's that's a bit of an embarrassment. Okay, um, if you don't have spoon and fork, okay, if you you run out anything in that celebration, it's a bit of an embarrassment. So I'd like for us to just fully understand what's going on in this situation for a while. Okay, there was a wedding and I would, I would assume, okay, I haven't really looked into this, but I would assume that this is a big wedding. And there were actually gate crushers here. And you know who the great crushers were? Okay, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he was invited, but by virtue of the fact that he was popular, so people started flocking into that place. And perhaps that's the reason why there was a shortage of wine. Okay, so uh, it happened to us. Okay, in the reception of our wedding, there were some gate crushers. Okay, in a sense, these are people that I do not know. Okay, people that my wife do not know, and yet they were there enjoying the food. But nonetheless, okay, nonetheless, going back to this, um, there was a wedding, there was a shortage of wine in the wedding, yet, what do we observe? What do we observe? We would see that there was no, what? There was no mention of the name of the groom and the bride. You folks thought about that. Okay, there was no mention of the names of the groom and the bride. There's no such thing as Franz and Hurley nuptials. Okay, there's none of that. It just said that there was a wedding and there was a shortage of wine. Now, I want us to understand that John, you know, records a precious moment. You know, if we start talking about wedding, it's a milestone, isn't it? Right? It's a big celebration. It's a big thing. Yet, John did not record or rather intentionally skip the names of the groom and the bride. And I want us to understand that it's ve- that's very important. Okay, let me put it this way. Um, when you love short stories, you love reading short stories, right? Um, when you, if, if, you, if you look at the short stories, okay, authors, <clears throat> you know, when, when, when authors write their stories, they would try to engage your senses, right? They would try to engage your, your olfactory sense, your sense of smell, your sense of sight, Right when they start talking about rain, you know what? Normally, okay, uh, you could just say that you know it's actually raining today. But for them, they start talking about the, the the scent of the rain as it touches the soil. Okay, they start talking about the sound of the spatter and the rain on the roof and stuff like that. They go into details. All right, authors usually would go into details, and yet here 
we would understand that there was no details given here. There's no, uh, there's no color that was given. Um, there's no color of the dress of the bride and stuff like that. We don't see that in this story right here. So the question now here is why? Why? Why were these details not given? And I want to bring this or submit this as early as now. Because I'd like for us to understand that John did this intentionally because the focus is in Christ. The focus is always in Christ. If you remember, <clears throat> when we had our Abide series, and when we had a series uh, last month, okay, uh, two months ago, we, we looked into the book of John. What did we say? We said that the book of John, specifically John chapter 1 and John chapter 2, it is so high in Christology. Meaning to say, John was very clear that ang bida ng story na to si Jesus. Alright? Yes, we may be talking about uh, life's biggest events. We can be talking about wedding for that in, in, this, in this aspect. Yet, the focus is still reserved on our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So John wanted to make it very clear that the focus is concentrated on Christ. Now, scripture, if you want, if you if, if, if you'd allow me to share this for a while, scripture is a beautiful, it's if you if you get into God's word, it's a beautiful story. It's an epic story of Jesus and his kingdom. And can I say this to everyone? This one, yes, though we are the object of redemption, sino po bang sinave sa story na to? Who's the recipient of salvation? Come on now. Us. Okay, so yes. Okay, we are the recipient of salvation. But at the end of the day, we would understand that the story is not about you. Okay? The story is not about you. Or actually, I thought we're talking about miracles here today. Okay? The couple encountered a miracle. Yes. The couple encountered a miracle or experienced a miracle. But that is not the fundamental point of John here. Okay, in John chapter 2. I am not here, I'm not here saying that God or Jesus will not create miracles to happen in your life. Of course, we will pray for that. Okay? But until we understand, until we understand that this is all about Christ, we actually miss the point. Scripture is an, is an epic story. And all of us here this morning are mere what? Supporting cast in the story of Jesus and his kingdom. And I want to establish that as early as now. Perhaps... Um, in our blogs, uh, in your in your TikTok, in your Facebook post, whatever, in your Instagram, um, perhaps to a certain extent, we could exhibit uh, an attitude wherein, um, instead of drawing attention to ourselves, we draw attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's all about Him. Amen. Okay, it's all about Him. So let me just proceed. Okay, now. Um, there are a few things that I'd like for us to look into here. First, I want us to look into verse 11 for a while. Go to verse 11. Look at this. Um, after, after, you know, writing the narrative, the story, John said this, he said, is the first of his, come on now, is the first of his signs. Okay, Jesus did at Cana, Okay, in Galilee. Okay, so this was accordingly the first sign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to understand that every time you get into John chapter 1 and John chapter 2, it's full of signs. Okay, it's full of signs. Now, go with me for a while to John chapter 20. Turn your Bibles for a while. Turn your Bibles for a while to John chapter 20 verse 31. We've covered this actually last Sunday. Look at verse 31 of John chapter 20 of the same book. It says here, But these things, or these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Catch it? Okay, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in His name. So what is my point? What is the point? John was saying, John was saying that this is the first sign. So if this is the first sign, there's a second sign, there's a third sign, there's a fourth sign, there's a fifth sign. There are many signs, 
And the conclusion of it is found in John chapter 20, verse 31. The reason why these signs, these miracles are given to you is that this, all of these things should point us to Christ. I mean, this should point us to Christ. This should make us believe in Christ. Look at this. It doesn't say here, but these are written so that you may believe the signs. No, that's not what it says. It says here that you may believe Jesus, that he is the son of God. Culturally, I wanted to emphasize that because culturally, uh, in the Philippines, um, do you know that there is such a thing as, uh, what do you call this? Um, Medical tourism. Right? There's such a thing as medical tourism. Um, People find, let's say people find St. Luke's Hospital in BGCR or QC uh, as a top tier hospital. And yet the cost of being admitted is quite cheaper compared to when you are in Singapore or in other nations. So because of that, people come to the Philippines to get treated here in some of our hospitals. Okay, so... I offer them our NOPH, you know, our, our hospitals. But anyway, but that is not just the case. You folks realize as well that culturally, because of the cultic nature of, of our nation, people also come here to do a different kind of medical tourism. Okay, in a sense that, you know, people come to the Philippines and approach faith healers and stuff like that for, for them to be treated. Okay, and of course, we understand that many of these people are scammers, but yet, people are actually looking for miracles. Now, if I announce, if I announce that, okay, Victory Dumaget is having a series called Miracles. Invite your friends who are sick, invite everyone, okay, who doesn't have money, invite everyone who's gonna, and we're gonna, we're gonna do any word of faith stuff to, to cause them to be healed and stuff like that. I am pretty sure that this place will be, fa- will be packed with unbelievers. But I'd like for us to understand, let me, let, me, let me put it this way. Say for instance, say for instance you're driving in Shaton, okay? You're driving in Shaton and you're, uh, you're driving in Shaton and you went past Shaton, you went past Zamboangita, and the moment you enter Darwin, there's a signage there that says Jollibee, okay? 20 kilometers. So what do you do? You get so excited. But who among you know that it's one thing to be so excited with a sign. And it's another thing to, for, it's, it's, it's one thing for you to park near the sign and eat your food under the sign. Compared to really get to the place where the sign is pointing you and really getting into the restaurant and feasting whatever the restaurant is, would, would, would offer you. The purpose of signs and miracles, and I like that ESV says that these are signs. The purpose of signs is these things point us to Christ. Okay, these things should point us to Christ. Now, allow me to, um, you know, to do a bit of an exposition on some of this. So let me start with verse 1. Look at verse 1. For us to understand that these are signs or markers that point to Christ, Let me look at verse 1. It says here, on the third day. Everybody say third day. Now that's interesting. It says here, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Okay? Now, I think we need to understand what third day is. Okay? If you are to fully embrace... What this story is all about, let's try to understand what third day is. So first, okay, let me look into this for a while. Um, uh, First things first, the author of the book of John is, come on now, John, right? The author of John is John. So um, remember when John started, uh, when, when John started writing all of these things, we would understand that he's actually particular with the sequence of days, Right? Um, I think it was during Christmas, I, I, I preached on, you know, the next day and stuff like that. Okay, John is particular with the sequence of days, specifically or especially in John chapter 1 and John chapter 2. 
All right? So uh, the next day, on that day, these things are important. The sequence of days are important. John would want us to see that there's reasons or meaning to this. Okay, let me start with verse 29. Look at verse 29 for a while. Okay, verse 29 is the first time that he mentions the word the next day. Tama po ba? You see it there? The next day. So if it is the next day, it tells you that there was a day prior. Alright? So if verse 29 is the next day, so the first day is whatever transpired before verse 29. Catch it? Are folks following? Now, next one. Okay, we have verse 35. We have verse 35. It says the next day again. Then you have verse 39, which is that day. But it says it is the 10th hour. It is actually the next day. Okay, then you have verse 43, the next day. And then that leads all of us to John chapter 2, verse 1, which says it is the, it is the third day. All right? It is the third day. Now, here's what's interesting. The Hebrew way of walk or of, of looking into the sequence of day, sequence of days, gives us a picture that the third day, can you go up there for a while? The third day actually here, in their understanding of this word and their sequence of days, the manner in which they interpret it, the third day here actually is the seventh day. All right? So that third day there that we are reading in our English Bibles right now is actually transpiring on the seventh day. Are folks following? Coming from verse 29. Okay, the next day, the next day. This is actually the what? The seventh day. So what, what is the point? Here's what we have. So it gives us a picture that the miracle of Cana, the miracle at Cana in Galilee, happened on the on the seventh day. It happened on the seventh day. Why is this significant? Why is it significant? Why is it significant? Why do we have to look into this? Because if you look at this, what is the difference between the book of John and the same synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? What is the difference? Okay? The clue there, the difference is John chapter 1, verse 1. Right? The difference between the book of John and the rest of the, the, the records of the Gospels is found in actually in John chapter 1, verse 1. What, what, what do you have in John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word. So we've talked about this in the past. What are we talking about? It gives us a picture that when John was writing this Gospel, when John was writing this story, okay, he had the book of Genesis as a backdrop. Clear enough. Okay, so he wasn't just he wasn't just recording and writing. Okay, he had a backdrop in mind. He has he has he has an inspiration taken from Genesis itself. Okay, he has he, uh, he has Genesis the book of Genesis as a backdrop. So, if you look at so as John was writing John chapter one and two, he was right he was thinking about Genesis chapter one and two. Clear enough. So if, if that is the case, what can we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? What's the story that we find in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? The creation. Okay, we see the creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And specifically, what happened on the seventh day of the creation? We understand that God rested from his creation. Okay, God rested on the seventh day. So what do we have here? What do we have here? John is actually telling all of us or unpacking to all of us that on the third day, which is actually the seventh day, the seventh day, Jesus is giving us a picture that he's actually performing what? A work of a new creation. It's actually a work of a new creation. So, so, so if, you, if you look at this, okay, if you look at this, he performs the work of a new creation. Look at, I have here a slide. Uh, that, that, that shows us chapter verses 3 down to verse 10. Look at the word that we have here. We have the word wine. Like he mentioned a couple of times. One, two, three, four, three, six. Okay? 
The word wine is, is, uh, is mentioned here uh, six times. So on the seventh day, we understand that Jesus creates a new creation. Now, why is this important? Like what I said, these are one of the many signs. Now look, in John chapter 2, in John chapter 2, Jesus creates a new wine, isn't it? In John chapter 3, remember his exchange with Nicodemus, okay? Jesus creates what? A new birth. If you go to your Bibles, go to John chapter 4. What is the story in John chapter 4? It's the story between what? Jesus and the woman at the well. He, Jesus creates what? A new way to worship. A new way of worshiping. So all of these things are signs that John is recording as Jesus performs all of these things. Now, looking at this further, so in John chapter 2, Jesus was invited to a wedding, isn't it? Okay, he was invited to a wedding. This was his first miracle. Now, I want us to understand this. What do we have here? Jesus was invited to a wedding, and he didn't bring a microwave as a gift. He didn't bring ang tao as a gift. Didn't bring a car as a gift. Didn't bring the famous wedding gift, rice cooker as a gift. Didn't bring pillows as a gift. But what happens here is that he brings what? As a gift, he brings what? The inauguration of a new creation. It's far deeper than just a wedding celebration. In fact, I realized that, oh, no wonder, no wonder the couple was not named. The one, no wonder the couple was, was, was not named. Because the gift is for everyone who's going to believe. The gift is for everyone who's going to believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us. Now, so John is giving us a sign uh, that, his, that Jesus is creating a new creation. Remember, something's wrong with creation according to John chapter to Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, rather, teaches us that creation is what? Creation is groaning. Okay, travailing in childbirth. It is waiting for something. What's, what, what is creation waiting for? Creation is actually waiting for the new creation. Creation is actually waiting for the new creation. So what do we have here? In the wedding, in that wedding, Jesus is actually simply giving us a foretaste. Of what's going to happen in the future. Jesus is simply giving. It's it's like uh, it's like the future bursting forth and, and seeping into the present. But what we're seeing is actually what? What we're seeing is actually just a snapshot of what's going to happen in the future. It's like the future is holding off. And yet it is seeping in to make us understand or have a taste of what's going to happen in the future. By this miracle, John is simply saying that we are now in the already and not yet. That Jesus has come and he has inaugurated the new creation. Um, I'm thinking about this and it's interesting because the first miracle or sign of Jesus happened in a wedding. And what did I say? It's not about the couple. Okay? He's saying, okay, it happened in a wedding And guess what? The writer of this is John himself. What else is a book that John wrote? The book of Revelation. What is covered in Revelation chapter 19? The marriage that the church will have with the bridegroom. So the wedding here is also a snapshot of the future glorious wedding that the church will have with our Lord Jesus Christ. So the miracle here is pointing us to a person. The next one, okay, the next one, look at verse three, verse three for a while. It says here, when the water, when the wine rather ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. 
I want us to see how Jesus addressed his mother. Look at how Jesus addressed his mother. Jesus called him woman. Friends, I'm telling you, when I was younger, when I was younger, it was so clear with me and my brothers that our mom is the epitome of terror. I don't wake up in the morning and sit on the dining table and call my mom, woman, where is my, where is my food? Where is my breakfast, woman? Man, I tell you what, she's... <laughs> you don't call your mom that way. If, I mean, I've seen, how, I've seen how my mom abused my brothers, <laughs> which, which is something that doesn't happen in our generation right now. I mean, bakat na bakat yung sinturon. It happened to my brothers, never happened to me though. But we were all afraid of my mommy. She was, she was, she was just, she's just 4'11". She's just 4'11", and yet, you know, she's, uh, she, she spells terror on all of us. I don't call her woman. I don't call her any other name. I call her my mom. Jesus here is very clear that he's calling his mother woman. Culturally speaking, it doesn't even, it's not even appropriate for anyone to do that. Don't you ever think that, okay, because Jewish people, maybe they call their mother a woman. They don't do that. I don't think any culture would subscribe to something like that. And yet, Jesus calls him woman. So here's my question. Why does Jesus call him woman? And I think you know, you know what, what the reason is. Like what he said, he's writing Genesis, he's writing John chapter 1 and John chapter 2 with Genesis in mind. So when, he's, when he calls him woman, he's actually referencing to what? Genesis chapter 3. Which is what? The first promise of the gospel. That when God was talking to the woman in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, he says, I will put enmity, in, enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head. He was talking to, this, to Satan. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3 contains the first gospel promise. The seed of the woman, as we understand, okay, will crush the head of Satan. So by Jesus calling him woman, in short, Jesus was saying, okay, do not get so caught up with these things. Woman, remember, woman, who are you? You are the what? The promised one. And in you will come the promised seed. Who is the promised seed? I am the promised seed. It's far more bigger than the current felt need. The issue is not just lack of wine or lack of water or whatever. The issue is not just sickness. The issue is far greater than that. It's not just felt need, but it is the ultimate need that the world needs right now. And that is the salvation of their souls. Some scholars would say that you know, the entire Bible could actually be exegeted from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. What was Jesus essentially saying? He was, he was actually telling Mary, woman, this is it. In essence, that's what, that's what he was saying. This was the start of his ministry. Woman, do, don't forget, I've been with you 30 years. This is it. This is the inauguration. You are, you are woman. You are the woman of promise found in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I am the seed and I have now come to crush the head. Of Satan. If I say this to my mom, like what I said, my mom will feed me to the dogs. Look at verse, look at verse 5, look at verse 5. How does Mary, how did she respond when Jesus called her woman? Here's how she responded. She said, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
Do you think she was offended? No, she was not offended. I think all moms here would be offended perhaps. Even, even, even dads would be offended if your child would call your, your wife that way. But Mary was not offended. You know why? Because she got it. She was reminded. And instead, what did she say? She, she, she said, do whatever he tells you. He says, do what. He looks at the servant. Do whatever he tells you. What, is, what, 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 was, what was Mary saying? This is the Lord of all creation. Obey him. It's not the other way around. She was like, you're my son. You obey me. I don't care if you're 30 or 50. Do you mean son? Even, even our moms when they're 60 and then we're like 35, we're 45, they still have a lot of things to say to us. But not so with Mary. She looks at the servant and tells everyone, do whatever it tells you. This man, this son of mine, is the Lord of all creation. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, you know, there were six stone water jars with water. And they, were, they, were, they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Now, there are some, like what I said, like what I said, John gives details of the important things. He leaves out unimportant things. Right? He tells us that these six Stone water jars were for what? Would you read that with me? That's for the Jewish rites of purification. So these are not just ordinary water jars that you have there. Okay, specifically, these were used for the purification. And this is interesting. Um, interesting because he tells us, John tells us the number of the water jars. Now, this isn't a stretch because like what I said, if you go to John chapter 1 and 2, it's full of symbols, full of numbers, full of signs. Now, may I ask everyone again, who was the writer of the book of John? He's also the writer of the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, we understand that seven is a perfect number. Isn't it? And we're talking about the same author here, and it tells us there are six water jars. If seven is a perfect number, in the book of Revelation, six then is something that is imperfect. In fact, a trinity of six is the mark of the beast. And true enough, true enough, if you look at the six stone water jars, what were they used for? They were used for ceremonies to what? To cleanse, to purify people, to get rid them of, come on now, of sin. So you have these this, uh, this six stone water jars to uh, use in a ceremony to help get rid them of sin and the guilt of sin. Now, here's what I want us to understand. Guess what? I'd like for us to understand it was so imperfect. The ceremony was so imperfect. It was so imperfect that they have to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. The ceremony is endless. There's no end to it. It's as if it happened during the time of Jesus only. No, they've been doing that for centuries. It was something that was so imperfect. So what do we have here? John chapter 1 verse 1, and the word became flesh. We said that Jesus himself was the creator. So what do we have here? So the creator of the heavens and the earth. The Son of God incarnate, as we understand, okay, the seed of the woman, he has come to take what? He has come to take the, these six symbols of, the six symbols of imperfection, and he's going to create something what? Something new, something magnificent, something, something lasting, and something fresh out of these jars. He creates something great amongst these things that were so imperfect. 
John writes, if you look at John chapter 1, verse 14, sorry, verse 17, it says here, For the law was given through Moses, and truth came to Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came to Jesus Christ. We also have that in verse 14. Moses, quote unquote, authored the ceremonial law, and now here comes Jesus dispensing grace upon those who will believe in his name. I don't know with you, um, but if I look at this, one of the things that I rejoice with is I am in this side of the book of Malachi. That I am not living in the times of symbols or, or shadows or types, but I'm living in a generation and an era that has experienced or, or have seen and witnessed the fulfillment of all of these things. Look at the master's comment in verse 9. Look at verse 9. And I'm going to end with this. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and yet, and, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, then the poor wine. But he says, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is the comment of the master. What does it say? It tells us, friends, that everything Jesus creates, everything that Jesus ushers in, they're always the best. Everything that Jesus brings into our lives, everything that Jesus answers, any, answer to Je any answers to the prayers that, that we utter towards Jesus, it's always the best. In fact, you would understand that there's a picture of extravagance here because John writes how much water, how much gallons of water this water jars can actually carry. The sheer extravagance gives us a picture that those who belong to the kingdom of God will experience. Those who have a union with Christ will experience the sheer abundance of the blessedness and hope that only our Lord Jesus Christ can bring in our life. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we say unto you, the salvation that you give is the very best. The salvation, Lord, that you give is the very best. Sometimes, Lord, we see beautiful homes. We get into beautiful mansions. We see beautiful cars. You see beautiful things around us. We see beautiful offers. And yet, God, nothing Lord, the collective beauty that this world can offer us will stand in pale comparison, Lord, to the beauty and blessedness, Lord, that we will find in you. And Lord, I pray that we will be a people who will fully embrace that the greatest miracle that we can experience in this lifetime is our salvation, is our changed life. May we be a people, God, who will always see and embrace where these signs and miracles point us to. And that is toward you our Lord and Savior. We are one with Mary in acknowledging that you are the Lord of all creation. We are one with the disciples in obeying your every word. We are one with John in exalting your name and making it a point that you will always take the center stage in this local church and even in our personal life. 
as we worship you, as we praise you, as we adore you, as we take pleasure, Lord, in the, in the beauty of your word, in the beauty of your works, in the beauty of your person, we ask, Lord, that you would also answer the different prayers that we utter. The different needs, Lord, as we understand that you will meet. We look at this story. We don't know the name of the couple. But Lord, you have saved them from embarrassment. You have saved them from lack. They would have made headlines the next day. So in the same way, God, it is our prayer here right now. As we look to you, as we fix our eyes on you, we know, Lord, that you save our souls, but you also save us from embarrassment. You also save us, Lord, from last event. You save us, Lord, from, from our trials and difficulties and the circumstances, Lord, that we may be in. As we start a brand new year, we fix our eyes on you, we exalt your name, we glorify you, and we worship you, our one true God our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Can we just give God praises for this, everyone? Can we all stand on our feet now as we end this with a prayer? To, beginning tomorrow, like what we said, uh, we're going to have a corporate fasting. Uh, it's a corporate prayer and fasting. Um, every single evening, beginning tomorrow, uh, we're going to have prayer meetings here. So I really hope that you could join us, okay, the next five days. Um, I really hope that you could fast and um, I figured out that many of us, many of us in our generation right now are, you may not know or acknowledge this, but many of us are actually really addicted to our phones. Okay, we're addicted to our phones. And I want to challenge you, I want to challenge you in the next five days to include, okay, to include this specific addiction, okay, as part of the things that you're going to fast from. Okay, I don't know how you're, you're going to do that, but together with any food fast that you're going to do, I hope and pray that you fast from anything that consumes your time, uh, that wastes your time sometimes, whether that's entertainment or whatever. And I hope you start the year just focusing on the Lord uh, and, you know, um, understanding what His will is for our lives this year. Amen? Can we just lift our hands before we're on this space for the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace, shalom, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. That is our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, everyone.